Tonight, I want you to turn to the book of Judges, if you would. The book of Judges. And uh, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, remember the requests that have been mentioned this morning. And um, just to pray for uh, those that have prayer requests. But Judges chapter 3. And uh, before we read the word and get into it, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening. We thank you, Lord, for a beautiful Lord's Day. Father, we thank you, God, for blessing us today with this place. And Father, there's uh, many more things, Lord. I, I know that I know, Lord, they'll help God's people. You, this is how you helped me, God. This is exactly the same way that you made me to understand the nature of what, what kind of, what can I expect in life? Is it all going to be rosies and sunshine and daisies and everything else? No, it's not always going to be that way. And if it's not that way, is it because I'm doing something wrong? No, it's not always that you're doing something wrong. Lord, it's just some things, Father, that you bring our way. We may not understand why you did it until later. When we look back and see how your, your hand moved the chess pieces of our life, in such a way, Father, as to ultimately bring a victory. And, and, and Father, just like in chess, there's sometimes it will cause you sacrifice a piece, knowing what you're doing, knowing that in the end it will benefit, the plan will work. The devil is wise, but he's not as smart as you. He will never outthink you. He will never outsmart you. Neither will any of us. So, Father, when we don't understand your plan, God, have mercy on us. You do, because you know, Father, that we don't see past the next five seconds much less the next five hours or five days. We don't see anything. So, Father, I pray, God, that you would um, that you'd give us understanding, Lord, of the, of the tough things that we encounter and the, and the hard things, Lord, that we have to deal with. That you'd give us wisdom and guidance and counsel, Lord, to understand these things. So that, Lord, we're not angry with you, nor do we have those thoughts that this Christian life is a joke because some preacher made a bunch of promises that just were not biblical. And because those preachers lied to people, those people, Father, just gave up on you. Well, it wasn't your fault. They just fell for a bunch of stupid preacher lies. Lord, that's why we have a Bible. And it is from this book. With our name on it. Written for us. And for our learning. And for our teaching. and So that, Father, we could see what lies ahead. We could see, Father, what's going on now. We could see what has happened to us in the past. Lord, we can begin to see all of these things. I pray, God, Lord, that you would help us with that. Each one of us, Lord, have probably a part of our past that makes us who we are now. So, Lord God, just bless us and open our eyes. And Lord, let this teaching go out and, Lord, help somebody. Save somebody, Lord. Keep them, Father, the way you did me. Or I just, I would not be here today without it. So Lord, you bless and you do that which pleases and honors you. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. 
Now, let me give you a little background in the, in the book of Judges and in the beginning of Judges. The end of Deuteronomy, they are ready to go into the promised land. Moses is giving them the last instructions, 32, some 32 chapters worth of it. Uh, and then God takes Moses up onto a mountain and... Moses basically turns around and waves goodbye to everybody because that's the last they're going to see of Moses. Moses gets on top of that mountain. God allows him to see the promised land. And what that is, that is a type and a, and a, and a, what the, a foreshadow. God is teaching us something here. Number one, that Moses will not and cannot get you into the promised land. You cannot say, I'm going to keep the law and do good deeds, and that will get me into heaven. Moses cannot lead you into the promised land. S somebody named Yahashua has to do it. Joshua, I like the King James. There are no mistakes in the King James. Joshua, at one place in the New Testament, is referred to as, guess, guess what name? Jesus. Okay, you think that's a mistake? It's not. And, and boy, here I am chasing rabbits already. When, when Moses was told to pick the 12 men, God told him exactly who to pick that was going to go in and spy out the land. He picked a man that God named him Oshia, which is a, a form of Hosea. Isaiah, Hosea, Oshia, they're all related. But Moses called him Jehoshua. And what that means, Oshia means Savior. Yahashia means Jehovah is the Savior. Okay? Which is where we get the name Jesus from Jesus is the Greek form of the Hebrew name Yahashua, which was Joshua's name, and that's what Moses called him. It's Jehovah that saves, and that, and in that he was saying it right. So anyway, I had to chase that rabbit down a little bit. Um, now where was I going with that? Anyway. Uh, so in at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, Moses dies. God ha, God uh, buries Moses, preaches his his uh, funeral service. Probably angels are in attendance. Moses died 120 years old. His full life force was in him, but God just was not going to let him lead everybody into the promised land. So he died there on the mountain, seeing into the future, but not being able to get into it. Now, once that happens, Moses has already picked, well, God helped him, uh, Joshua, to be the one to lead them into the promised land. Joshua then is a type of Christ. It won't be Moses, it'll be Yahashua, Jesus. It'll be Joshua who leads them into the promised land. And in the book of Joshua, um, I like this, it's, to me, I pictured the book of Joshua as like um, Tom Brokaw's book, The Greatest Generation. And it was written about the men and the people who came out of the Depression and fought World War II and then came back and built, literally built, the greatest nation on earth and I'm I love going back and studying all that and to be honest with you if I could snap my fingers and make it happen I would I'd snap my fingers and we'd all go back and live back in those times again everybody wants to go jump in with me we'll all go back all you ladies going back and wear them nice skirts that them ladies used to wear and us men walking around with suits on and nice Little hats on. I, oh, I would love that. But anyway, um, the book of 
Joshua is that. Those are the men and that generation. They fought the war that needed to be fought to get that land from the people that inhabited it. They fought for that land. Many of them died for that land. They fought, they put down their enemies, and to them, that land was precious. If you want to know what I think needs to take place in America, we need this idiotic, pampered, multi-gendered, young generation to wake up and have some foreign country invade this country and show them what it's like in the rest of the world and how good they've got it. I guarantee you they won't make it. They won't make it. And... Um, I've said this for years. I think we need a, I think we need a famine. I think we need poverty. I think we need, uh, empty plates and empty shelves. I think we need, uh, real enemies who are, who are trying to take over our very towns and cities and for a generation of people to learn how to fight. Sorry about that, JR. I made him lost his phone. Learn how to fight and and learn how precious this country really is. And it's not to be squandered away. And that's the book of Joshua. That generation fought the battles. They're, that generation is old now. They're old men dying off. I was talking to the funeral director who buried my uncle uh, last spring, a year ago in spring, and he said, I think your uncle is about the only one left in Jacksonville of World War II veterans. He said, I think there might be another one that we do, but he surely is close to being one of the last ones that we had. And they had him buried in his, I love that Marine dress uniform. And I, as soon as I saw him in there, man, I was bawling like a baby. Uh... But my uncle was a man's man. Now, he had his flaws. I know about his flaws. But he carried the biggest, heaviest gun, Joe, that they had on them Japanese islands. Many of the, his friends got blown away, exploded, shot next to him, everything else. My... Um, my grandpa's brother, Uncle Epom Hoggard, that's, I don't know where he got the name Epom, but anyway, his real name is Russell. But I found out that he was on the second wave. Roy, you're going to like this. He was second wave D-Day, Omaha Beach, made it through the second wave and headed right for the town of St. Mary Glees. If you watch the movie, The Longest Day, that was the main town that they had to get if that invasion was going to be a success. It had to be St. Mary Glees. And my, my granddaddy's brother was there, second wave, fighting all the way, made it to St. Mary Glees, won that town, won that victory, him and his buddy were down in a, in a trench one time, trench warfare, not too long after that. And there was a sniper up there and his buddy just stuck his head up like that to see if it was okay to fire. Boom! Wiped him out right then and there. So that's the book of Joshua. So now we're in the book of Judges. And God knows that there's a younger generation now that, ha that has this land for free. And it was given to them, their daddies, their old men who fought the battles to get the land, those old men are dying off. And you know how a new generation is. Oh, when granddad dies, I'm going to get his inheritance. And what do they usually do with it? 
They'll get a $100,000 inheritance and blow it off in drugs and everything else in about six months' time. Well, God is equating that to your salvation. Let me ask you a question. Is your salvation worth fighting over? Is it worth fighting for? If it is, you're going to have to fight to keep it. So that's what God is doing here in Judges. The younger generation has settled the land. They've been given it for free. They haven't had to do anything for it. It was just given to them. But as we know, when children are given things that they did not earn, they are less likely to take care of it than if they had to actually earn it and work for it themselves. Am I telling the truth? So let's read it this way. Judges chapter 3 verse 1. Now these are the nations which the Lord left. Who left them there? God did. You see, God told Joshua, go in and kill all the nations. That's what God did. God knew Joshua wouldn't do it. And he had a plan in that. I'm going to leave some of them in there. I know Joshua's not going to do what I said. I'm going to, I'm, but I've got a plan out of this. After Joshua's generation's gone, those people are still going to be in that land. And that younger generation is going to learn how to fight. So he said, these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them. Even as many of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan. There it is, what I just said. Only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war. At the least such as before knew nothing thereof. So... Lisa and I realized this. I realized this. My mom made sure that my sister and I were here every service. And we were following her faith. And I can tell you that even me just even going to Bible college. That faith got tested. In Bible college, that faith got tested. And my mom saw it. And we had more than one argument over that. She was worried about her son, about how he was going to turn out. She saw that it was making me different. That is always to be expected. Children, when they grow up and they sort of start moving in their own, it is their own direction. And so anyway, I had to learn how over the years to fight for the faith that I once had as an innocent child in this church. And they were battles that I wasn't sure I was going to win because they were very difficult battles. God knew what he was doing. And God, when I look back now, I can see that God never intended that I would slip away completely. He was teaching me how to fight battles. My mom had already learned how to fight them. There were things that when she got saved... There was a struggle going on. I remember it. She struggled with certain issues after her salvation. And finally, over time, God began to aid her and help her. He didn't do it all in one day. And God did not remove these enemies all in one day either. You know what he said? 
He said, I'm not going to take them out for you all in one day. I'm going to do it by little and little. And that's where we get the expression, little by little. Right out of the King James Bible, that's where we get it. God said, I'm going to remove them by little and little. Not all at once. Okay? Because if, how do you think you would be if... Like five days after you got saved, God took away all your sins, all your sin nature, and now you just don't have any sin nature at all whatsoever. How, how do you think you would be toward everybody else in this world? Why, they'd shoot and kill you. Why does this guy look down at us all the time? Does he think he's perfect? Well, he actually is. Well, let's shoot him. Okay? I mean, wasn't that the reason why Cain wanted to kill Abel? Okay, all right. Then he said, verse 3, namely, five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and Sidonians. By the way, five lords of the Philistines, five represents death. The greatest enemy you will fight is death. Death. Not just your death, the death of people that you love. Because at some point, people, listen, church, listen, at some point, you're going to lose people. People in your life that you love dearly are going to die. And it doesn't do you any good at all to be angry at God over it. Not when you understand that those people were born the same way you were into a world that is cursed because of sin. That's why everybody dies. Some die soon, some die late, some die somewhere in the middle, but everybody dies. And if you haven't experienced that, gone through that yet, you don't know how to fight it. At some point, you're going to have to learn. There's... there's there's been more than one person that has lost a loved one and then been angry at God over it and walked out on God. Five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hivites that dwelt in Mount Lebanon from Mount Baal Hermon even to the entering it of Hamath. And they were there to prove Israel by them to know whether they would hearken unto the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. So here, God left in you a little bit of a sin nature in you. And he said there are going to be thorns in your sides and and pricks in your eyes and I'm going to leave them there I'm not taking them away for you because what I want you to do is I want you to learn number one how to fight them off those who've ever had an addiction whether it's been alcohol drugs porn sex you name it Whatever addiction they've had, it either kills them or they learn to kill it. But you can't live and coincide and coexist and be friends with your addiction. You can't do it. When I say addiction, I'm talking about basically your sin nature. The things that you are drawn to, the things that... Your flesh wants to do. So God leaves them there. Why? To teach you how to fight. When you get tired of that junk, 
You get tired of that stuff. You get tired of living that life. You don't, you can see what it's doing to your, to yourself, to your family. You can see what it's doing to your children. You'll say, God, I, I've, I've had it. God, get, help me get rid of this thing. I don't want it. Do it for your sake. Do it for my children's sake, my, my family's sake. Do it for my church's sake. God, I may be what's holding my church back from growing. I don't know. But God, whatever it is, help me get this thing out of me. Teach me how to fight. David said, Lord, teach my fingers to, do, to know warfare. Teach my hands how to fight. So in verse 5, the children of Israel dwelt, dwelt among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, and Perizzites, and Hivites, and Jebusites. And watch this. They took their daughters to be their wives and gave their daughters to their sons and served their... Now, let's think about this for a minute. The Israelites took their daughters, their Jewish maidens, gave them over to the Hittite boys to be married. You know what's just happened? The Jewish parents have just now been locked into the Hittite group because of the son and the daughter and now the grandbaby. Whereas God told the Jews, kill them and get rid of them. They decided, well, our daughter, he's, she's sweet on that boy. He's a, he's a Hittite, but he's a good kid. There's nothing wrong with that. And they let him get married and started having children. God says, now you'll never, ever be able to fight against them. Because what are you going to do? Kill your own grandchild? Because that's what it's going to take. Because I won't let them live amongst my people. I want my people pure. That's what God was saying. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and forgot the Lord their God and served Balaam and the groves. Well, uh, if we look chapter 3, uh, past verse 7. In verse 8, therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he said, sold them into the hand of Chushan Rishon Theim. Chushan is, is a, the first part of that is, a, he was a Cushite. Cushan Rishon Theim, king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served Cushan Rishon Theim eight years. And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel who delivered them, even Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel and went out to war. And the Lord delivered Chushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into, the, into his hand, and his hand prevailed against Chushan Rishathaim. In other words, when they cried out, when they got... Sick of that. They cried out to God. God sent them a savior. And God would raise this man up. He would give this man power. That man then would uh, put down the evil king or bring down the evil army, armies like Gideon did. He'd give him a, a Gideon or he'd give him a Samson or he'd give him a... Uh, you know, a whoever, and give them a mighty judge. Moses was the first of these judges. They, that's how they were ruled. They were ruled by the judges. In other words, they were ruled by the law. And the judges just basically judged based upon what the law said. And from Moses, then to Joshua, then to whoever was the first judge in here, and then by the time you get to Samuel, Samuel was the last judge of Israel. I think you've gone through 17 judges. And after that, they went into 
being ruled over by a king. But anyway, 15 times I think I've counted in the book of Judges, they went through this cycle. I want you to listen to this. They went through this cycle where they served God, did fine, everything was well. But what happens when we get there? We think everything's good, don't need to read our Bible, don't need to pray. Then we get full of pride. And God starts letting sins back in and we start turning our back on God and God has to bring us down way low and he puts us under cruel authority and we live under that for a while and and don't anybody tell me that God does not put evil men in charge of godly people. Don't you ever tell me that. I can read you a hundred Bible verses that deny that. I, I've, had, I've had people argue with me ever since I started doing this back in 2009 that God does not put bad evil presidents in the White House. Oh, yes, he does. Oh, yes, he does. You may not like it. Okay? But he does. He does. So anyway, that's what God would do. And every time they cried out to the Lord, God would be faithful and he would have mercy on them again. Understand that your life is not a straight line like this. You are going to go to heaven in cycles like this. You are going to be like a tree planted by rivers of water. That tree grows in rings. It means it grows in cycles. And they can tell, you can cut a tree down, you can tell every year they had a lot of rain. If, if there was a forest fire that year, because it would be marked inside that ring. You can count how old that tree was and how, how well that tree did that year. On any particular year, you can look at those rings. But that was the measure of it. And watch this now. Every time a tree grows another ring, you know what happens to it? It grows a little stronger. And then it grows another one. It's been through another cycle. You know what's happening? It's got a little stronger again. And by this time now, it's about 80 years old. And do you think that just a little bit of wind is going to come and knock it down, blow it over? No way, no how. That tree's there. He's a tree planted by rivers of water that shall bring forth his fruit in his season. Somebody say amen. God shows you that he is a seasonal God. And you might look at your life right now and say, well, I just don't see God doing anything in my life. Oh, I wish God would do something in my life. Oh, I want to do something for God. And then we try, what we do is we make the mistake and try to make it happen. I've tried that. I tried it, tried it, tried it, tried it, tried it. Nothing worked. Nothing did. And then I started doing what God wanted me to do. And all of a sudden it started working. Anyway, boy, it's, oh, I never even got past the first deal. I might have to teach some of this next Sunday night. Yeah, and I'll probably add a bunch to it too. Because this right here. There's a couple stories I really want to spend some time with. Because I think they're very, very important. Um, so yeah, I think, I'm, I think I'm going to stop here. Study 2 Chronicles 20. I think... Maybe the first or second or third sermon I ever preached... JR in my life was Second Chronicles chapter 20. I know it was very, very early on I preached a message out of Second Chronicles 20. And it's still one of my favorite places in the whole Bible. It is. It's one of my favorite places in the whole Bible. It'll show you that's not your fight. And it'll also show you, God will tell you, 
Stay out of it. I'll do it. Does that sound good to you? Stay out of it. You got, I'm, I'm with you, Lord. I'm the king of stay out of it. All right? Let's stand to our feet.